Is the idea that we are living in a computer simulation a real possibility? Or is this a sign that we can all be victims to a Hollywood fantasy? My boss, Nick Bostrom, wrote the paper about the simulation argument. So just quickly outline it. He argues that if we survive and get our act together as a species, we're going to develop in an advanced post-human civilization with enormous computing power. And at least some of that is going to be used to run simulations of our past because of entertainment, historical dramas, or figuring out what really happened in those important years in the early 21st century. And of course, that's going to be a lot of simulations. So hence, it seems like if you're a mind in the early 21st century, you might actually more likely be one of the simulated minds rather than one of the few minds that exist in the real world. So his paper ends up with a trilemma. We have to believe in at least one really annoying or crazy thing. Either that we will never reach this post-human state, that we will go extinct because of some uh, global disaster, or that post-humans never do this simulation, May either because it's impossible to actually do, or because we're all deciding, oh, that would be totally unethical, subjecting people to the world of 2021. No, that's not ethical, not even to simulated people. Or the third possibility, we're actually happily simulated. Well, I don't like the simulation argument, but that's not in itself a good reason to dismiss it, uh, although it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> the simulation argument that Anders beautifully summarized is really weak in a couple of ways. Firstly, it asks us to assign probabilities to things that we have really no idea how to assign probabilities to. What would our far distant ancestors feel like doing with, with some extrapolation of the kinds of technology that we have today? People have an idea of what a computer simulation tends to mean, probably motivated by a desire that we might, if this is true, we could upload ourselves into the cloud and, and live forever. Uh, so we, we're asked to assign probabilities where we don't have a good idea what those probabilities should be. More importantly, it's not just a trilemma. It's a, I think it's a quadrilemma. I'm not even sure if that is a word. Is that a word? There is a, another fundamental assumption in all these ideas that is glossed over. And this is the idea that consciousness is substrate independent, as, as Bostrom himself puts it in his, in his lovely paper, that it doesn't matter whether you know, brains are made of carbon or silicon, that conscious, that if you run the right program on a computer of some kind, consciousness will happen. He says this is widely accepted in philosophy of mind and in neuroscience. It is somewhat accepted, but that's also not by everyone, and it's not obvious at all that this is the case. There are some things which if you simulate them, you bring them about. A computer playing chess actually is playing chess. There are other things that if you simulate them, you, you just simulate them. You don't actually instantiate them. If you have a, a simulation of a weather system, it doesn't actually get wet. It's a simulation of a weather system. So where does consciousness lie on the spectrum? I don't actually know, but I'm very suspicious of assuming that it is something that we can simulate. Basically, that trilemma or that quadrilemma shows that there is something wrong here. Something in the reasoning that led us up to this situation is really wonky. And that is useful to know. Uh, then we might say, OK, I totally believe that that one is not plausible at all. Uh, or this tension, we can investigate that. <clears throat> we can get in front of a whiteboard and try to see if we, I can make a, a model that shows the right kind of local symmetries. We can get over to the questions about, wait a minute, credibility and plausibility and possibility here. Maybe that is actually breaking the argument. But it, notice that these things are internal in some sense to the philosophical thing. It doesn't tell us that much about whether this reality is actually simulated. For that, we need to look for pop-up windows or uh, some weird bug in physics. I mean, that leads me on to the, the burning question that I have. I don't know about any of you right now, but like, what would it take to prove that? Like, how are we going to prove if we are or aren't in a simulation? Suppose we go out into space and finally meet aliens, and they turn out to be a real advanced super civilization, and they, they are running zillions and zillions of ancestor simulations of their own ancestors in order to find out some weird alien questions about history. That seems to be the kind of evidence that would change our plausibilities a bit, because we know at least that looks like they, for some reason, are able to do. Then maybe we are all simulated. You want to try getting a grant for that? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so first, we need a space you program. Especially a five-year grant. For yeah, that. might need a. Yeah. 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 Very happy to do it. Well, I think I think it's. I mean, it's it's. I think it is a little. 
it's a little much to ask of it to, to come up with proof or, or evidence. It doesn't seem the kind of thing that evidence can bear on in a useful way, at least in the, the near-term horizon. I do think the value of it, in as much as there is, is in just probing some of the natural sort of rivers of thinking that we, we tend to apply. Ultimately, I, I, I still think there's great reason to be skeptical of both the argument. So we should distinguish as well the argument, which is this trilemma or quadrilemma, from the hypothesis that this is actually the case. Right? So you could actually turn it the other way around. This is probably really bad philosophy, but you could turn it the other way around and say, OK, this is actually a very, the simulation argument is a very good argument against functionalism, because um, if functionalism is true, then the simulation argument might follow, and that seems bonkers, so let's not do that. Uh, but that's not, that's not good. But I do think it's useful well, how like it changes it. the way we think. I, I like it. I, I don't think bonkers doesn't necessarily mean that the argument is wrong. <laughs> to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.